Hi, I'm Nathan Barr. I'm a film and television composer, and I'm happy to welcome Spitfire to my studio today. Uh, I just finished this 8,500 square foot uh, recording studio about a month ago, um, and so I'm just happy to show you around. This is the writing room, control room. And this studio was really important for me to go with like the vibe of it. Um, there's a, there are a lot of studios that are sort of very utilitarian and industrial, and aesthetically they don't inspire me. So I really worked very hard to, to turn this into a place with a lot of vibe. You can see this back wall here, which is a diffusion wall. And rather than go with your typical diffusion panels, we decided to do books, which I thought was a really, had a great feel to it. So there are 66% of this wall needed to be diffused. So we use different books, and you can actually order books by the foot. Um, so we, I said I wanted 66%, uh, however many feet that was, um, uh, 1850 to 1950 books. And then they come in the mail, and you just stack them up, and we worked with our acoustician. And it's not so careful. You can't move a book around or anything, but it does have a really great effect. Um, and then this couch, we've had probably 12 people on this couch before, which is pretty cool. So it has a very, very fun vibe. Um, and then this is the sort of, everything is oriented this way. The stage is there through that, on the other side of that shade. So that's where we record orchestra or whatever we're doing. But we really felt like um, it wanted to be film and television studio first. So when people come in, producers, they can watch the picture here. Um, and you'll notice I didn't put in a big console. I thought long and hard about that and I decided I didn't want to do like a big um, console. I, th I think um, the way plugs are working these days um, and a bit of outboard gear, Millennia HV3Ds, which are great preamps. We'll rent in some preamps, mics, and then do everything else in the box. And it was a really good way to go. And then what's cool about this desk is um, the keyboard will pull out. We can play and then just push it back in when we're editing. And it just makes the focal point, <clears throat> whatever's going on here, uh, and it, it can be my, it's my composing studio, but at the same time, when we go ahead and we're going to be uh, mixing or anything, we can sort of put that away and forget about it. Um, and then I have a pretty bad back, so we also made this, um, put it on hydraulics, so we can bring that up nicely, and so we can sort of divide the day between sitting and standing. Um, and this, obviously, standing is not optimal in terms of speaker position, but when we're sitting, we found the sort of the sweet spot. So we're sitting uh, with these uh, BMW um, speakers. We've got a 5.1 uh, surround here and then a, a, a sub, sub back there. So it's, yeah, it's just very comfortable and easy to work in. And then I have my guitar wall. This is one of my first guitars when I was a kid, and I, I went to Fat Tuesdays, which is where Les Paul used to play, and uh, got him to sign it. So you, you could kind of bring your guitar down there as a kid, and he would sign it for you. And then this is a Schecter, given to me very generously by my friend Tyler Bates and signed by Billy Gibbons, who used it on a score years ago. And that's, it's a baritone guitar, which has a great sound. Then this is a guitar I go to a lot. It's a Gretsch, Chet Atkins model. And then this is a very unusual guitar. It's made by Gilchrist, um, and he's a mandolin maker, and he makes four guitars a year. So it's a really beautiful archtop guitar, um, a Duff mandolin. And then this is super unusual. This is a one of a kind. It's called a guitarangi, and it's, it can be played like a guitar or like a cello. You can hold it like a cello, which hence the weird shape. And then it's got all these sympathetic strings on it. I'd have to work with it a bit to get it playable, but it, it does have a really cool sound to it. I mean, I believe it was one of the, uh, I'm gonna show you another instrument later that uh, Fred Carlson built, who built this. But as you can see, it's a really gorgeous instrument. Let me just show you a couple other things. So this is a nickel harpa, which is a Swedish fiddle of, of a design that's many hundreds of years old, maybe even a thousand years old. beautiful sound. As you can see, there are sympathetic strings. There are four in between each of your melody strings. And then you've got these tabs or these keys that press in the string where you want to play. It has a really beautiful sound. It's like a 
sort of a more resonant fiddle um, because of these strings. It sounds like you're in a big hall. And that's something I use quite a bit. This is a hurdy-gurdy. So it's got a wheel, this wood wheel, that spins and plays these chanter strings. And then you've got sort of an option of three drone strings you can engage with the wheel or not. If you basically took this, if this and that nickel harpa made a baby, I'll show you what that would look like in my, on my stage. Another unusual instrument. The last one in here is, that's a human bone trumpet. So that's actually from Tibet. It's probably 200 years old and it's a femur. It's a human femur. Um, and it makes a pretty crazy sound that requires a lot of effects. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be sort of a super musical thing, but some monks, when they passed away, had their bones made into relics. And so trumpets or um, skull cap percussion. Um, this is just a funny thing. Among all these books, we got all these interesting random books. It's Songs of All Colleges from like 1902. Almost every song starts with a fourth. Totally bizarre. So this is the scoring stage. We have a big airlock in here, so we're completely isolated from the outside. And this entire room is floating. Um, so that there's no uh, worry of uh, any sound coming in from the outside. And this, this room really started for me. I started thinking about a room like this 20 years ago when I first came to Los Angeles to do this. I wanted a big, beautiful room that uh, I could record solo cello in or piano or whatever. And um, just to play, sort of a playground, like a big playground. Um, and it was incredibly complicated to get it right because we had to get it right for this organ right here, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, the ceilings are 24 feet high at their highest point. Um, it's about 50 feet by 32 feet wide. Um, for House of the Clock on its Walls, we recorded orchestra in here. We had uh, 34 strings, and then we did 11 brass, organ, and um, harp. And we could probably easily get 50, a 50-piece orchestra in here, which we'll do at some point when the right project comes along. Not a bad place to come to work at every day. Um, we have basically mics set up in different places, and I'll sort of bounce around from, from place to place, um, and we'll record a bit. And we bring a big TV in here so I can, I can just watch the picture. Um, this is sort of that instrument I referenced before, built by that luthier. It's a really unusual instrument. I guess I was inspired to have it built, and then Fred Carlson actually built it. And um, I told him I wanted a cello that accompanied itself with the drone, because I love drones. It's a five-string cello. And then you have 10 sympathetic strings here. And then what makes this so incredibly unusual is the fact that it has a mechanical drone on it. So if I engage this pedal, It'll play this automatic drone. And that's like a hurdy-gurdy wheel right there. So it's a wood wheel that spins. And you have four strings that you can bring into contact with the wheel. It's a really cool sound. I love this. Um, it took him four years to build because anytime you put a motor on the, on the body, it wanted to accentuate the, the pitch of the motor. And so what he did brilliantly is he found this robotic motor, which is um, speed variable. And so you can actually hide the sound of the motor behind the strings, whichever one you want. So currently this is a G drone. And so basically we have a... Um, uh, I, I've basically turned this variable speed pitch until the motor gets to about a G. And it's, it's barely, you can barely hear it, but it really hides it nicely so you don't hear it at all. And it can be a little temperamental. If I adjust the drone...
if you listen really carefully, there's you can hear the the motor sort of the pitch of the motor changing. So, and there's California black walnut, which is a, a really unusual wood to use for a cello, and then Sitka spruce top, and then this little dude at the top was hand carved. It's based on a walking stick at the Louvre that we saw, and Fred um, carved had one shot at it with this piece of wood to carve it. It's like this little puck. I thought that was kind of fun. The focal point of this whole studio is this organ over here. Um, this entire building only exists because of this organ, basically. Uh, I sort of tumbled down this rabbit hole uh, about seven years ago when I found that, out that this was still in existence. So basically back in the 20s, all the big um, studios had pipe organs on their scoring stages. Universal had one, Paramount had one, Warner Brothers had one. So this was installed at Fox Studios in 1928. It was built expressly for Fox, um, for the scoring stage. And I had it completely restored, and I obviously became completely obsessed with it um, to have put this amount of effort and everything else into it. Basically, I had the, the whole console completely uh, restored. There was like actually a chord chart scratched into the lacquer here when I first got it. It did not look like this. It's got all the original keys, which is very unusual for an organ of this age. And basically, it's an orchestra. So these, these instruments were designed to accompany silent film. So once you got past a, the idea of a piano or an orchestra playing to silent film, you got to this. And this was sort of the Rolls Royce of a way to score films. And it basically put an entire early synth orchestra at the hands of one organist who could sit down and engage all these different stops um, in order to create the sound of an orchestra as close as they could in the 20s. And as I explained, this is like just the remote control for the organ. This does not make any music itself. All the music is made up behind that wall. There are actually five rooms up there, uh, and there are 1,366 pipes up, up in those walls. And this is the control for those. Um, and it, it's got a really amazing sound. So if I press on this pedal, these pedals, you can look up there and see that they, they open and close the, uh, the shutters. And that's, that's basically a way of allowing more volume into the room or less volume into the room. Because a pipe is either on or off. So um, the only way to, to get, make it louder or softer is to put something between you and the pipes and open and close those. And then there's a lot of percussion. I'm going to have my friend Mark do this, but... So you have... Uh, one of the things that really differentiates a theater organ from church organs is you have a, a... We have a whole room here packed full of percussion, bass drum, snare drum, uh, tuned sleigh bells, xylophone, glockenspiel. There's an actual piano that's a part of this organ. And so it just gave you even more um, uh, ability to really accompany a silent film in, a, in, a, in an amazing way. Um, and this organ is the organ you hear in uh, The Sound of Music, the wedding scene. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith used it in uh, Star Trek, Patton, The Omen 2, a bunch of others. John Williams used it at least five times. Empire of the Sun, which is of Eastwick, Home Alone. Um, Bernard Herrmann used it in The Day the Earth Stood Still. So it has this incredibly rich history, which is partly why I was so excited about um, seeing it restored and, and given a home. Um, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's a part of the earliest um, film music, which is so cool. And so uh, I want to bring my friend Mark in to, to demonstrate it. This is Mark Herrmann. Like Nate said, it's, it's an entire uh, symphony, really. Um, so you have all sorts of imitative instruments, like, for instance, here is a clarinet, uh, 61 pipes that sound like clarinets for different pitches. Uh, or you have, um, for instance, trumpets. A tuba. And um, all the percussion sound. And um, they all sort of come together to create this very orchestral sound. You have these pipes that sort of give the effect of strings. Uh, 
flutes. And when you put it all together, it really creates a very symphonic sound. So one of the things I added to this was a piano, an actual upright piano. So when you ordered an organ from Wurlitzer or uh, some of the other companies back in the day, you could actually um, tick off that you wanted a piano as a part of the organ, and then the piano would mechanically play from the console. Um, and and I, I really liked the sound of a piano with the organ. I felt like it was a good texture to have. So we put an upright piano in that corner, which was built originally for the Portland Paramount. And I um, found it, uh, had it restored, and then uh, Mark can actually play that from, from the organ console here. So basically, um, this piano, this is, this is a series of magnets, um, and uh, it's vacuum pressure. So uh, basically electricity, wind, and, and magnets is how it plays. Uh, and then there's this thing called the mandolin bar here, which Mark can drop up and down with the press of a button. And, and uh, it has these little uh, sort of metal pieces on the end that, that fall down in, in between the hammer and the string. And then you get that sort of tack piano sound. Do you want to play something again? Yeah, I guess I, I can take you up now and show you sort of what the instrument is. So this instrument occupies six rooms, requires six rooms, not including the room we're standing in, which is the room you listen to it in. Um, and so up in these walls is 1,366 pipes and a bunch of other stuff that I can show you. And this entire area is um, floating free of the building as well. So this, this is sort of like the case for the organ. So we've got a spiral stair that goes up to the uh, pipe where all the music is made, and then down here is where all the mechanical bits are. So basically this is where all the air is routed before it goes up to the pipes. So all these regulators here regulate pressure with these springs. Each one of these is sending a different pressure column of air up to a set of pipes. We're standing under about 800 pipes right now. Um, and then these, each of these boxes uh, creates vibrato. And everything you see is from 1928. It's original to the organ. All of this was at Fox Studios with the rest of the organ. So when you buy the organ, when they bought the organ, all this came with it. Um, so in here, so uh, I'm going to take this lid off of this box. And inside here is what creates vibrato. This is the way you create vibrato with the theater organ. It has a lid in here that's bouncing. The air goes in and pushes the lid up, and a couple of weights push the lid down, and that fluctuation fluctuates the air pressure, and that's how you create vibrato on a pipe. Um, so there are one, two, three, four, four of these in this room. Five, actually, because there's one above us, too. And th this is, there's a little bit of black magic that goes into making these work properly. And oftentimes, it's the length of distance this, these sit from the pipes, the chests where the pipes are. So that one needed to be, this one needed to be quite far away. You can see this wind line here in order to get it to work just right. And, and this is what distinguishes sort of the master organ builders and restorers um, from the layman is, is, is sort of that, that knowledge of how to do this. And the gentleman, Ken Chrome, uh, who I bought this organ from and who restored it, is, is one of the masters of this with his team. 
Um, and so it's, it's, uh, but you can hear there's a lot of mechanical noise, which you don't want to hear on the stage. I really wanted this to be a recording organ. So the walls are super thick. Uh, there's two layers of drywall, one layer of sheetrock, special insulation, special framing. So truly, when you turn this on and you're standing on the stage, completely silent. You don't hear any of this. Um, when this was at Fox, all of this stuff was upstairs with the, uh, with the pipes. So it was, it was quite a noisy organ. You'd turn it on, and even before you started playing the music, you'd, you'd hear all this, this noise. That's this room. And now we'll go upstairs, which is where all the music is made, all the musical elements. So the first room I will show you is where all the percussion is. And this is what really differentiates this from a church organ. Watch your head. So as you can see, amazing room full of instruments, all original to the, the organ. You have a marimba here. Back here we have cathedral chimes. And then over here we have actually tuned sleigh bells. So there's uh, leather straps on the other side of this action. Uh, they have uh, sleigh bells attached to them and then that shakes up and down with the pneumatic. And that's how you have uh, these tuned sleigh bells. And if you look down here, you can kind of see them bouncing up and down. And then this is a uh, box that was made just to make the sound of, a, of the surf, of an ocean. And then th this is a uh, Wurlitzer called this a chrysoglot, but it's, it's really a celeste. Behind each one of these bars is a little resonator, and there's a disc that you can engage to spin that vibrates the air behind the bar, and that's how you create a vibraphone. And then we have a gong. It's one of the things I added to this room that wasn't originally a part of it. And then up here we have uh, wind chimes which again are triggered from the console. And then uh, here we have a glockenspiel. And so this is a, this is a xylophone, chromatic xylophone. You can see all the, the beaters here, the mallets. This entire shelf here is all the percussion and foley for the organ. Uh, so this is an Acme siren. So this is was one of the little whistles that you'd have. When you hear that phrase, all the bells and whistles, that refers to uh, a theater organ. Uh, here's a police whistle right here. Here is a police siren. If you look up here, this looks like two coconuts, and when you activate that from the console, you get the sound of a, a horse. And then you've got a little reservoir up here filled with oil, and when you put a whistle into the oil, it bubbles through, changes the pitch, and makes the sound of a bird. Um, and then if you look up to the very top there, I added a slide whistle because I thought it was just a, an amazing piece of mechanical engineering to, to actually take a real slide whistle and, and allow it to play uh, in an automated way. And so now we're going into the main chamber, which is as you're facing the organ from the outside, it's the left chamber, and it has about a third of the pipes in it. So you can access everything. They give you, there's a bit of crawl, uh, crawl space and, and um, planks here for you to step on and, and maneuver around. And so you can kind of get all around the organ. So when you're tuning these pipes, you can be in here. Same with these guys. 
Uh, it's a lot of reaching over. It's quite complicated, but fortunately, you don't need to tune that much because um, the room is temperature controlled. Uh, this room is 72 degrees and about 45 to 50% humidity, and that keeps everything nice and, and in tune and stable. So we're now standing in what's called the main chamber. And as you can see, uh, there are a whole lot of pipes in here. Um, of the 1,366, probably a third of the pipes are in this room. Your smallest pipes are right here. This is the treble end of the chests. And you realize how amazing an organ is. You look at how small that is and how high pitched that is. And then you look at, compare it to this pipe, this low pipe here. And just that, that uh, range of, of, a, of a pipe organ is so incredible. Um, each one of these is a rank of pipes that approximates the sound of, a, of an orchestra. And so we can just play through some of these. You want to play something on the tuba? So that's that rank. Um, and then the, these, for example, are um, called Viola Orchestra, VDO. And you've got uh, a, a normal video, and then you've got a video Celeste, which is tuned a little bit out of tune, so you get sort of a vibrato. Can you just play the video first without the Celeste? Now when you add the Celeste, it adds the slightly detuned rank. It's supposed to give you a bit of that sort of uh, string vibrato sound to it. Um, and then right here is the uh, flute rank. And then nearest you is the clarinet rank. And then this rank, um, so all these, all these ranks are chromatic, which is unusual, very unusual. In, a, in an organ, um, you, you, your highest notes are on this end of these chests, your lowest notes are down there. Most uh, seed organs you'd see would be on diatonic chests, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, out, um, like this. So there are two diatonic ranks in this organ. This is supposed to sound like a choir. It sounds nothing like a choir, but when you mix it with an ensemble, it at least gives you some sort of effect. Can you play the... This is a rank you never play with, without vibrato, without the tremulance. But can you just play it once without the uh, tremulance? And now with. And it, it's actually really good for making a goat sound. So then along these walls, we have what are called the offset chests, which is where your biggest pipes go. Um, and these, these are some of the lowest notes. It's the, the, the lowest of the diapason rank. Want to play those? So it's got this really, if you were standing in the room right now, you can really feel the bass right through you. And we've been doing a lot of experimenting with recording some of these bass pipes, and they sound tremendous. It's really exciting and you can kind of record these but there's just a different experience to being in the chamber with the pipes and even being out there listening to the organ it's just there's something that happens um, physically in the room that you obviously cannot record um, but that's so this is the this is the main chamber so now we're going out of the main chamber and past the percussion chamber to the solo chamber which is where most of the pipes are in the organ so this is uh, low C sharp, three octaves below middle C. And if I fire it here locally, you'll see the amount of air it requires to play that note. It's basically a slit in here. The air comes out, blows across the lip, and it sends air up and back down, and that, that gets us C sharp, uh, and it's an eight foot pipe. As you can see, it's quite hefty. You barely get in the door around it. This is an oboe horn, quintadina, which is a string rank. Uh, I've got orchestral oboe. Uh, we have tibia here, 
And tibia, more than any other rank in a theater organ, is that classic amazing sound uh, that, that is the sound of the 20s and 30s. And there's a very famous organist from that time period named Jesse Crawford, who sort of really took the uh, tibia and, and made it a part of what we now think of as the most classic theater organ sound. Mark, do you want to play uh, something like that with the trams on the tibia? It's quite loud in here, um, and that's not even close to the loudest rank in here. Um, but anyhow, that sound, you hear that sound, and it's just classic 20s, 30s. Uh, and then uh, you go over here, we have an English horn, uh, we have a saxophone and a trumpet. You can see uh, the saxophone pipe. It's not a saxophone the way we think of it today. It's a reed color that you add to other ranks in the organ to give it sort of a different... Uh, give whatever you're playing a, a brighter sound. And then you've got brass, these brass trumpet pipes, which are quite tall. They get to up to eight feet. And then this whole wall back here is very rare. These are Wurlitzer um, solo strings. Uh, it's a solo string and a solo string celeste. And again, the solo string is tuned A440. The celeste is tuned slightly. Is it sharp or flat? Sharp. Slightly sharp. And that when you play those two together, uh, you get that sort of... Um, waver, which is like vibrato on a string. Do you want to play the solo string and Celeste? Uh, just do the bass, bass end, the 16 foot. It's basically, it has that super airy sound, so it's like the bow on the string. And we've been experimenting with putting this behind cello or basses, and it has a really cool sound. And I think I've heard at Fox from Armin Steiner, who was, a, who was the legendary scoring mixer, uh, that uh, when they would use the organ occasionally, they would use it um, to basically accentuate. If they didn't have enough bass or cello, they would throw um, some of the, the, the 16 foot ranks of pipes behind the bass and cello, and that would give it a sort of fatness. That was really cool. And uh, that's something I've been experimenting with, too. So one of the things I thought might be fun is if we go under these pipes in this room and under the chests, and you can see the matrix, incredibly complicated matrix of magnets that all help these pipes speak when you play at the keyboard. And just keep in mind when you see all this, this is all technology that goes back to the 1900s, early, early 1900s. And this organ, again, 1928. So we'll go, we'll go down and take a look at this. Yeah. Okay. Right now I'm lying underneath the, uh, the chests here. And if you can see these black, uh, they're called black cap. So with each one of these pins under here, there's a pipe above it. And you're, you're, you're bypassing the magnet system and you're just pressing the primary valve and allowing air into the pipe. Pipe press. to be a rank. This is our string rank, solo strings. And all those cables and wires I showed you downstairs, that bundle, this is where they come. They all get come up here, then they get spread out into the matrix underneath these. And every single one of these uh, magnet caps has the magnet coil next to it. So it's incredibly complicated, and all of this goes back to the very early 1900s, what you're looking at right now. My interest in this organ is obviously the history of it in the, in the uh, film, film business and TV, uh, and then the, just the beauty of the instrument itself. But I'm also, when I first heard one of these years ago, I thought about it from the point of view as a composer too, because I think there's a whole universe of sounds that this instrument offers that haven't been experimented with. and so. For the film I just did called The House of the Clock and Its Walls, um, throughout the score we used this instrument. And sometimes we'd use it traditionally in the way it's known for. And uh, for the end titles, we basically took a couple of orchestral cues and Mark Herman um, 
and I worked at sort of putting it into the player system of this instrument so that we could capture the performance in a way that you couldn't, a single organist couldn't sit down and play it necessarily, but the organ itself can be programmed to play it in a rudimentary way. We're still working on getting logic to work with, with this uh, instrument. So I'm just going to play you this piece that was originally for orchestra, and we tried to basically arrange and program um, for the organ that, that piece. And you're going to hear really the, the full dynamic range of this instrument, all of the, the colors and sounds it can make. It's, it's pretty incredible. And when you see the movie, The House in the Pocket and the Walls, if you listen at the end credits, you'll hear this. I love that, the sound of that, and it's, uh, it's, I think it's a sound that, that you don't hear typically with this instrument. And we're just getting to the very tip of the iceberg of what this is capable of, but I think that was a, a fun exploration of, of what this instrument can do. So this is a set of uh, Deegan shaker chimes, and J.C. Deegan pioneered A440. He, uh, his company made a lot of bells and, and, um, and uh, pieces for theater organs, and. Um, this particular instrument is, is pretty hard to find and pretty rare, and my friend Mark <laughs> found them uh, and told me about them. And, and these are often found exactly the way this one was found, which is underneath the bed of a woman who passed away by her son. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's amazing when they show up. And basically, uh, if you know what an anklung is, an anklung is an Indonesian instrument, and these are bamboo instead of alloy or metal. You shake them. And basically, uh, you've got your three chimes here. Octaves. And you put them all together, and you know you can make music with them. And these are your black keys, uh, and they go diatonic up at the upper end, but you know. They have such a beautiful sound, unique sound. And again, the Indonesian version, it would be exactly the same thing, except it's a much more woody tone, more like a marimba or something than a, than a chime. Um, so this is, I call this my butchered piano. It's a piano um, that I flipped on its back, and uh, my piano tech cut off the keys and the sustain pedal. And this I got huge use out of in True Blood and also the Americans. And you can play it with all sorts of hammers. And we put in this sustain system so you could sustain uh, just the treble and leave your bass free for. Or you can uh, disengage that. Let's see here, how do I do this? That, and you can get sustain in your bass. And then you've got your. You get all sorts of cool sounds that way. And then the theme, you know, I played for. Uh, Let's see here, for the Americans, you know. This looks like a standard pipe uh, pump organ. Um, Oftentimes when people see these these days, it's out in a driveway waiting for it to be hauled away by the trash or something. Um, originally, you would have had a reservoir inside and you would have pumped the pedals and provided air to reed pipes. 
And what I did uh, with my friend Mark, um, we came up with this idea to really experiment with pipes. Um, so this actually has a series of blowers back in with the Wurlitzer, and we ran a wind line underneath the foundation of the room back up to here. If you look back here, you can kind of see the wind line. So this is the wind line that goes out, out of this four inch conduit or this four inch wind line, and that goes all the way under the foundation about 55 feet that way into a series of blowers which provide wind for this. And we, we basically gutted this old pump organ and just use it as the sort of the case for our, our, um, the experimentation we're gonna do, which we're really excited about. We put in the seven deadly sins here. Um, and then Inkito, which is to arouse or turn on, that turns on the instrument, turns on the, the blower if it provides the air and back. And then Crepitus, it turns on a second blower in series and it overblows the pipes. So you get this crazy shriek out of these pipes. And we don't have it, uh, we're, we're just still experimenting. We just got this in here yesterday. Um, but it's, a, it's gonna be a really exciting instrument. And um, also figuring out what these guys do. We don't even know yet, um, but we have lots of ideas for how that's gonna work. <laughs> So this is the lounge. Kind of went all out with it. And um, just as the organ, which was built in 1928, just as that aesthetic drove the aesthetics of the stage, as you can see, it drives the aesthetics of the whole building. So very Art Deco. This is not like so unusual, but it's a Victrola from the early 1900s. And plays shellac records. You crank it, there's no electricity or anything else. And with these old records, um, there's a little needle, and you replace that after every single play, or else you destroy your records. So, believe it or not, there are guys who make these needles, and you basically put it in here, and then you engage the spring, and then you put this down, and close this. And you open this, this is your volume. So if you want it softer, the volume. Make an organ. What's that? And then over here. I should actually show off the room quickly because the room is very specifically built for the purposes of scoring. If you look down in there right now, we have a second floor view of the stage. So when we did House of the Clock on its walls here, we had the conductor where the harpsichord is and then the orchestra laid out here. And then all of the folks from Amblin were up here enjoying the session, hearing uh, the feed through these speakers watching picture there, and, and it, it, it allows a, a larger number of people, like a super comfortable setting, to be a part of the session without all of us having to cram into that room like sardines uh, downstairs. Um, so it's kind of a cool, um, cool function of this room. Uh, this is made by the same guy that made the shaker chimes downstairs, Deegan, J.C. Deegan. Um, and it's basically just a super loud glockenspiel. It has a keyboard on the back here, so you can play. It's not working right now, um, and it's, it was a, an attention getter for at a carnival or something. You would put this, put this there, have them play, and people could hear it for literally miles around. Um, and then this is, uh, this was built for me. This is kind of a standard um, crank organ or street organ that you would have seen. Uh, starting to show up in the 1800s, even some t even the 1700s, um, has 108 pipes or thereabouts, um, and it's again nothing uh, nothing you plug in. It's all acoustic, and, and the card pushes the teeth down, right? 
And then as the teeth pass over, they are allowed up right there, see, and, and let in the air. So if we put that in there. thing up here is this uh, very early upright piano. So this is called a euphonicon, and it was built by Stewart um, in London in 1830. And it's Macassar Ebony, old gross Macassar Ebony, which you can't really come by anymore. Um, and it needs a restoration, but basically he took the bass end of a piano harp, and instead of going crosswise, and so then you're contemporary piano uh, case would go around it, like in that box. He just ran it up and made it look like a cool harp. And it's capable of all sorts of cool sounds, you know, that um, we've experimented with. Um, and it's got this incredibly heavy frame. I mean incredibly heavy. I think it's like 600 pounds. It took four guys two hours to get it up those stairs, and they snapped two stairs. So I don't know if this will ever go anywhere, but um, it's a really cool forgotten about piece of history. Like a lot of these things, um, you know, the Wurlitzer um, is, a, is another piece of uh, musical history that has kind of been forgotten about. And I think it, it, it has a role in contemporary music. I love sharing all of these instruments uh, with people because I didn't know about them myself seven or eight years ago. And there was a whole incredible period in history in the early 1900s, late 1800s, where people were building these instruments um, and they brought such ingenuity as engineers, as musicians, um, to the idea of making music, and none more than the Wurlitzer, which is uh, such, a, such an incredibly cool piece of, of early film music history. And since I write film and TV music, it, it was such a... I feel so lucky to have find the, found the instrument, become obsessed by it, to build the space, and then now to share it and get it back into film music. And, as I said, I used it in the House of the Clock and Its Walls. Danny Elfman was here and used it in the Grinch upcoming film. And um, I just know it's going to work its way back into film and TV history where it belongs. And so uh, thanks. <laughs>